Tumbledown Barn is an unlikely name for an early colonial dwelling, built between 1810 and 1820, that survived for over 100 years. The barn stood on a 55 acre farm that had been granted to a Mr Peter Farrell, situated at the junction of South and Eastern Creeks Riverston. The barn faced Eastern Creek and was estimated to be approximately two and a half miles from the site of Riverston Meatworks. Having probably commenced its life as a rudimentary dwelling, it had by the turn of the 20th century become a structure consisting of immensely long half-tree slabs, at least one chimney made from sun-dried bricks, and a corrugated iron roof with a water tank standing beside it. The earliest family known to be associated with Tumbledown Barn is McPhillamy. It is believed that a Robert McPhillamy, later of Gorman's Hill, was born to convict parents there in 1818. The McPhillamys eventually settled in Bathurst and became quite prominent in that area. McPhillamy Park in Bathurst is named after them. Another interesting early reference to Tumbledown Barn involves an early colonial couple who had the distinction of being the parents of the first white male child conceived and born in Australia. Anthony Rope and Elizabeth Pulley arrived with the first fleet in 1788 and married on May 19th that same year. The first child, Robert Rope, was born in the soldiers' barracks, Wynyard Square, nine months and ten days after the arrival of the first fleet. The Rope family, sometime shortly after 1818, went to reside at Tumbledown Barn for a brief period, before moving on to William Faithful's estate on South Creek. Their grandson, James T. Ryan, went on to become a member of the Legislative Assembly for New South Wales between 1860 and 1872. The Reverend James Hassel, a grandson of Samuel Marsden, mentions Tumbledown Barn in his memoirs published in 1902. Hassel had frequented the farm as a child between 1835 and 1839. His uncle, Charles Marsden, owned the farm and had also been granted 900 acres between Windsor Road and Eastern Creek. Two families from the Highlands of Scotland were employed at the dairy operating at Tumbledown Barn, making cheese and butter during this time. Young James frequently found their speech difficult to understand. To visit Tumbledown, James and his uncle would make a 12 mile journey through scrub and along bush roads on ponies, camping in tents overnight so they could fish in South Creek. They often broke their journey to Tumbledown three miles short of their destination to hunt dingoes for a couple of hours. Many families came and went over a long period. Tumbledown Barn came into prominence again when a meatworks was established at Riverston in 1879 by Benjamin Richards. In 1934, in the Windsor Richmond Gazette, it was stated that in 1885 a small wool scouring plant was built in one of the paddocks near the works, where all the pieces of wool were removed from the heads and legs of sheep and treated. This may have been the wool wash that was built quite close to Tumbledown Barn. So near, in fact, that the wool wash was initially called Tumble Down itself. It was estimated that only two miles lay between Riverston Meatworks and the wool wash. In 1883, a Joseph Henry Cragg came to live in Riverston with his wife, Mary Ann, and their five children. They settled soon afterwards at Tumble Down Barn and began operating a filmmongery called Tumble Down Wool Scouring Works. Joseph Henry had been previously operating a wool scouring establishment in Breakwater, Geelong, between 1873 and 1881. New South Wales electoral rolls between 1885 and 1894 show a Joseph Henry Cragg residing at South Creek. In the years following, he was listed as living at Essex Farms. The wool scouring venture at Riverston was not deemed a successful one in the long run, as the water used in the scouring was not suitable for production of good coloured wool. Pollution in South Creek was raised as an issue in 1884, with numerous wool scouring establishments on its banks receiving most initial blame. In June 1884, a journalistic investigation by the Hawkesbury Chronicle concluded that the water was contaminated by Riverston Meatworks, and we believe a large film marketing establishment at South Creek. Joseph Henry owed the majority of his business to the Riverston Meatworks, and greatly respected its owner Benjamin Richards. In a meeting of the Riverston Progress League held in August 1886 in the Cosmopolitan Hall, it was suggested by Mr. Jackson and Woods that Mr. Richards be written to regarding the awful stench coming from the meatworks. Joseph Henry, who was chairing the meeting, subsequently lost his temper at the suggestion of putting a motion so disgracefully insulting to Mr. Richards and, leaping out of his chair after the manner of a Spring Hill Jack, he turned a somersault over the tie beam landed on the secretary's nut and flooded the table with a deluge of ink from which the scribes' books were rescued. 
Looking disgustingly black, he then declared the meeting adjourned. Floods were common events in Riverston's history, and the land on which the Woolwash and Tumbledown Barn stood was prone to frequent flooding of both the eastern and south creeks. The flood of March 1890 saw. All the low-lying land about Eastern Creek is flooded. Mrs. J.H. Craig, J. Court and others are flooded out. The traffic between here and Marston Park is blocked, as the water is about eight feet deep on the bridge. This did not deter Joseph Henry from moving about the areas, was reported a week later. Mr. Joseph H. Craig of the wool washing establishment on South Creek has purchased for his own use a grand boat which he landed here on Saturday morning by the goods train. The craft, which is imported from Norway, is a substantial and well-finished one and will carry 16 passengers. Mr. Craig intends christening her swan. During the flood, he managed to carry 168 passengers in his boat to and from Marston Park in one day. Despite the flood of 1890, a year later it was reported that the Woolwash was doing quite well. Owing to the increase of mutton demanded in Sydney and the London market, and the number of skins to be dealt with, Mr J. H. Cragg has now 30 persons employed at his wool washing establishment at South Creek. Joe will make things hum. When Eastern Creek ever rose in a substantial way, the wool that had been laid out on the ground at the Woolwash had to be moved to higher ground to prevent it from being swept away. When the creek was at a more regular level, it was suggested in 1895 that people could row on it to within 70 yards of the meatworks. Sometimes minor man-made floodings at the Woolwash took place due to local youths plunging into Eastern Creek. Often they would meet on the banks of the creek for a picnic, where they would gather ferns and play various outdoor games. Sometimes these games led to a fortunate few being tossed into the water. In April 1899, Joseph Henry Craig announced that the filmmongering known by the name Tumbledown was now to be known as Jordan Mills. Along with the name change, he installed since January that year a quantity of machinery and embarked on other major improvements. He had been obliged to bring it up to the mark, and thus meet the wishes of the Board of Health. The Board had required, in the future, no washing be done in Eastern Creek, and the refuse water to be run off so it would not reach that stream. A little community sprang up around the Woolwash and Tumbledown barn. Joseph Henry Craig's daughter, Adelaide Rachel, had married one of the employees, John Towers, in 1896, was a cook for the workers at the Woolwash. It has been said that noble Hannah also lived and worked at the Woolwash or Essex Farms, but was ordered off the land after having an argument with Joseph Henry. He subsequently pulled down his house and re-erected on the banks of Eastern Creek. It still stands today at the end of Martin Lane though in a very dilapidated condition. It was a very good example of the type of house that existed in the Woolwash community around the late 1800s. Other names associated with the Woolwash during this period were Scully, Hayes, Windred and Parkhill. Often stories of encounters with black snakes, mishaps and sulkies, fishing, picnicking and rowing near the Woolwash would find their way into the local paper. As well as poor water quality in the eastern and south creeks, the successive floods of 1890 and 1897 also contributed to its troubles, culminating in the flood of July 1900, where it was reported. Riverston was visited by a flood, which in my opinion has done more damage than all the previous floods put together. The loss at Jordan Mills wool scouring works is very extensive, and damage has been great. One month later, in August, the effects of the flood seem to have had some effect on the working conditions at Jordan Mills, as was reported. We are told that the wool washers at Eastern Creek recently went on strike, and the staff is now entirely new. The genial Mr. Craig is a straight goer, and will stand no nonsense. Tumbledown Barn's occupants had also suffered immensely from the floods. By 1897, Joseph Henry Craig's family had entirely moved out of Tumbledown Barn and into Redgate on Farm Road. Though his son Matthew Henry Craig seemed to have resided at South Creek between 1895 and 1900. In 1897, Joseph Henry Craig's son-in-law, John Towers, had moved into Tumbledown Barn with his family and had taken over the daily running of Jordan Mills. The Towers family were still living at the barn in 1900 when the major flood of that year struck. The floodwaters of South and Eastern Creeks compelled the whole family to take refuge in the top portion of the barn until a boat was sent from Riverston to rescue them. 
Eventually, however, despite the constant flooding and unsuitable water supply, Joseph Henry Cragg was unable to secure the terms he desired from the Riverston Meat Company and ceased carrying on the fellmongery. John Towers continued to work as a fellmonger and lived at South Creek, at least up until 1906. By 1912, he and his family were living in Riverston Township. The tumble barn dwelling stood until about 1912, when the immensely long wooden slabs and other parts of the woodwork were pulled down. The half-tree slabs were taken to Riverston Meatworks for the purpose of stabling horses. Today, a lone gnarled pepper tree stands in the middle of a paddock, marking the spot of tumble-down barn. The tree, which was planted by John Towers, stands a couple of yards in front of where the water tank once stood. However, nothing remains of the woolwash itself. <laughs>